Well, John, thank you very much indeed for spending some time with us this morning to discuss your forecasts. In particular, I'm interested by you boosted forecast demand for your jetliners by 7.5%. That's versus December 2010. And I really wanted to get to the grips with what the drivers of this boost in forecast is, despite the economic concerns that we're facing at the moment. Well, again, uh, it's air traffic growing with GDP. And economic concerns are one thing, but the fact is you can't have GDP growth without air traffic growth and vice versa. Uh, Bloomberg, I know, and a few others have been talking about the lost decade of the last 10 years since the, the year 2000. Well, that lost decade may be in the stock market, and uh, unless you're a good stock picker, perhaps uh, it truly was a lost decade. But few people know that air traffic grew by 45% in the last 10 years. And that's after 9-11 after SARS, after the financial collapse of 2009, all that behind us, which did have downward blips, you still have 45% more RPKs in the year 2010 than the year 2000. And the interesting part of that story is also, we're flying those 45% more RPKs, burning about the same amount of fuel. Fuel during the period only went up by 3% fuel consumption. Think about how efficient we're becoming. I see. So. What I'm interested by is also Boeing has actually been a little bit more optimistic. They actually see some 30,900 mm -hmm. more in terms of jetliners, planes, whereas you have 27,000. Are you concerned by perhaps, perhaps the slightly smaller figure that Airbus is coming out with? No. Uh, in fact, what Boeing does, I don't know why they do it, is they look at some regional jets as well below 100 seats. My forecast is 100 seats up to the 380 at 840 seats and everything in between, but we don't try to go in and start looking at 60 seat or 70 seat jet market. We're not in that market. Uh, Boeing does. and it. Uh, you know, makes a mess of the numbers. But the fact is, I think our forecasts are quite similar. I see. So slightly distorting the fact just yeah. by that level. N inter interesting to note that you've boosted the estimate in demand for single aisle planes. I mean, they're already the most widely produced uh, jet that you produce at the moment. Why the boost in estimate for particularly the single aisle? Well, we we're looking at uh, 19,000 single aisle aircraft to be built and sold during this 20 year period. And our forecast, as compared to uh, a year ago, is increased by about 2,000 aircraft, almost all of them are in the single aisle category. Mm. Now, today there are 15,000 jets, 100 seats and above, flying around the world with the world's airlines. But of those 15,000 jets, 4,200 are not in production. They're old airplanes. They're fuel inefficient. They need to be replaced. They pollute the environment, they make noise, and they burn an awful lot of fuel. So a lot of those aircraft will be replaced by let's say today's built A320, you could save 20 or 25 percent in fuel consumption with today's A320 compared to an old MD-80 that's flying around the world. But then today's A320 can be replaced by a NEO, new engine option, starting in 2015, and save an additional 15 percent in fuel consumption. This is one of the ways that the industry can actually expand while not having uh, a negative impact on the environment or fuel efficient aircraft. 737 MAX uh, I think they're a little bit on their back foot here, and uh, they're not quite sure what's going on. They rushed that to the market after it looked like they were about to lose the, completely the American Airlines campaign when American Airlines wanted to go with both today's A320 and the A320neo, 130 of today's airplanes, 130 neos as well. They offered a re-engine 737, but to this day, we don't know how big the engine is. We don't know what the fan diameter of the engine is. We don't know what the takeoff weight is, the empty weight. We don't know what the fuel burn is, the takeoff performance. So I'm not worried about my competitor until my competitor figures out what he's going to build. Then I'll take a look at it and say where it ends up versus our airplane. So it's uh, some wishful thinking on their part about its performance numbers. They don't know yet. And some of the driving force behind needing fuel efficient airlines, uh, aircraft, is it precisely the oil price. We've seen oil mm -hmm. prices on the rise at the beginning of the year. It's turned around of late because of the concern about economic growth. Where do you see oil prices going and is that still enough of a driving force to see a lot of demand for these re-engined single aisle planes? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we see uh, oil prices moving up into the $120 a barrel range, then flattening out there on average for a period of quite a few years and then towards the end of our forecast period starts moving up towards the $140, $150 a barrel range. 
That doesn't mean that you won't have speculation and we might get a spike up to $150 or $160 a barrel, but we don't see that as a long-term phenomenon. But even at $120 a barrel, you need fuel-efficient aircraft. That's an awful big percentage of your total operating cost going just for the fuel bill. And previously we've heard a lot of you, you speak a lot about the emerging markets, the Asia-Pacific mm -hmm. region in particular, driving a lot of the passenger traffic. You've got a figure of passenger traffic growth of 4.8% year on year on average. Mm -hmm. Is that still what you would maintain despite potentially customers not having the money to spend on traveling quite to such, such an it's, it's really the emerging markets. The emerging markets right now are booming because one, they've started deregulating their economies. Even in China, it's becoming sort of a essentially controlled, but still in many ways deregulated economy. Investors can actually put up office buildings. There's an awful lot of economic activity there. And then in India, was very regulated, uh, transport sector is now opened up. You've got Kingfisher, you've got Jet, you've got uh, Go Air, uh, Indigo. That's allowing people who never flew before to start flying. There are today about seven billion people in the world, about two billion of them are middle class. By the end of this period, the middle class will go up to about five billion people out of perhaps nine point something billion in total. So once you take the middle class and more than double it, you start really generating a lot of demand for air travel, both for work and just for relaxation and pleasure. People like to travel. And so we've got positive outlook for demand. How are you going to meet that level of demand? You've already ramped up how many single R planes you think you'll be producing month for month. Mm -hmm. I understand it's 42 And we're studying 44 month. now, yes. We're now going to 44. Well, we're studying it anyway. We're studying. <laughs> so any potential for even further than 44? Oh, I think that we're studying uh, taking it further than that as well. Uh, whether we do that on today's built airplane or we wait until the NEO, it's very clear with over 1,200 NEOs being sold that we could take the production level up above 42 or 44 just because of the pent-up demand for that aircraft, which ended service in 2015. Do you have a sort of maximum figure you're looking at? I know 50 has been one of the numbers really mm. thought about by analysts that you could be ramping up to. It, it's possible. We're not coming out with that number yet because we have to study it very carefully. It's the supply chain that one has to watch. And uh, someone at today's press conference thought it might be the engine manufacturers. Actually, the engine manufacturers are very sophisticated and do a good job of planning. But sometimes in a supply chain, you'll get some small suppliers who just don't make the investment they need to make. And when production needs to ramp up, they're sort of running to catch up with three shifts and overtime, and sometimes it doesn't work. So you don't want to not be able to fulfill your contractual obligations just because one of your suppliers couldn't do what he committed to do. Any particular suppliers you can name at the moment? I understand that you see Chief Executive of EADS, Louis Galois, had said potentially CFM, the engine maker. Uh, can you name any particular suppliers you've got particular concerns about? Uh, well, not on Bloomberg television, <laughs> <laughs> but we have told the ones we're concerned about face to face. I see. So they're aware and you feel you can push through those bottlenecks? Are you liaising with these companies to be able to make sure you could ramp up to the extent you wanted to? Yes, yeah, we obviously work very closely with the supply chain on a regular basis. I see, that's perfect. And are you seeing any suppliers struggling, particularly with the A350s? That was an area of concern. Well, again, any program you have an area of concern, any new program, you have to watch your supply chain because on an A320, at least they've been building the A320. They've been building their parts for the A320. When you bring out a new airplane like a 787 or a 350, all your suppliers are making parts for the first time. They've never done this before, and some are more capable than others, and you have to be very careful that they don't promise something and then say, well, I, I can't meet the schedule. It's going to take me twice as long to, to build this part than I thought. That can really bring your production uh, down fast. So we have to watch that very carefully. We're concerned but uh, it's manageable. And how about final assembly lines? I know there was some speculation about moving into the US in particular. Is that still an area you're looking at? I know that you're still in Hamburg and Toulouse and China now. Would it also help particularly with hedging against any concern about the dollar, whether we'd see that the dollar fall against the US? There Euro? are certainly advantages to opening an assembly line in the US. But again, there are disadvantages as well, and that has to be weighed very carefully. We're very pleased with uh, our assembly line in Tianjin. It's working well, but it is a little bit higher cost out there to build the airplane. We would not want to move to a place like the U.S. unless we could convince ourselves that the cost of building the airplane would, in fact, be lower. 
And looking at the economy and wider, you're you know at the seat of a very important company. Looking at how dependent you are on economic growth, what are your main concerns at the moment? We keep having headlines about uncertainty with Greece, Europe slowing down. What are your key concerns from a macro perspective in the economy? Well, it would be the banks again. Remember, aircraft are financed mm. by somebody. It could be export credit agencies, hopefully not the manufacturer, although we've been known to do that when we have to from time to time. But very rarely does the airline just pay with its own cash. And we've seen problems with the uh, banking situation in Europe, uh, with the sovereign debt crisis, the confusion, especially in other parts of the world, about where is the real exposure uh, to some of this uh, you know, uh, bad debt. And that means that they're having some inability to raise dollar financing, raise dollars, because aircraft are purchased in dollars. The European bank needs to raise dollars in order to do the financing for the customer, and they need to have that ability to be able to raise the dollars. I see. That's perfect. Well, John, I want to say very thank you very much indeed for all okay. your time. You've you. given very full and thoughtful answers, so we very much appreciate it okay. here at Bloomberg. Super.